Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to the channel. I'm currently aboard Holland America Line's MS Rotterdam, the newest ship in their fleet. I'm on a 14 day tour of the Caribbean and today I'm going to take you on a tour of this amazing vessel. The Rotterdam is Holland America Line's newest addition to their pinnacle class of ships. Launched in 2021, the Rotterdam is 975 feet long, 114.8 feet wide and has a capacity of about 2,650 passengers. We'll tour her public areas deck by deck, starting off at the bottom with a deck, then working our way up to the very top at deck 14, moving roughly forward to aft on each deck. We'll also take a brief cabin tour when we get to deck 5, where I'll show you the balcony stateroom that was my home at sea for a full two weeks. There's a lot to see on board, so the video is divided into chapters for easy reference in case you want to skip around or come back to anything. Ready? Okay, let's get started at the bottom with a deck. ADEC doesn't actually make the official published list of the Rotterdam's deck plans, but it is important to note for two things. One is the onboard medical center, and the other is that there are two gangways down here, one midship and one forward. When you're docked at ports, this is typically where you'll get on and off the ship. But that's all that's down here for passengers, so let's head up to our first official deck, Deck 1, also simply called Main Deck. Deck 1 is mostly home to cabins, but there are a few public areas of interest down here as well. For each deck we visit, I'll show you the deck plan on the right-hand side of the video, along with any applicable stateroom details on the left, so you can get a sense of what is where. Note that every deck after a deck has a name and number, and I'll use a mix of both descriptions as we go. So as for the public areas, midship on main deck is where you'll find the three conference rooms, Hudson, Stuyvesant, and Half Moon. These rooms are used for meetings, but some of the fun activities on the daily program can also be held down here, so it's good to know where the rooms are. Down here, you'll also find the internet center and the bottom of the atrium, which stretches all the way up to deck three. That's it for main deck, so let's head up to deck two, where things start to get a bit more interesting. The plaza deck is our first big public deck. No cabins here, just a whole deck chock full of fun stuff to do. Starting at the front of the ship, you'll find the first level of the World Stage, which extends up to Deck 3. The World Stage is the main theater venue for all kinds of shows and lectures and features a two-story LED screen with a wraparound display. Really impressive tech. I saw quite a few things here over my two weeks, including a comedian, a magician, a behind-the-scenes look at life on board, and a great lecture all about the ocean. The World Stage is a lovely space, the giant screen is fantastic, and there's not a bad seat to be had. No bar inside the venue, but there is waiter service for drinks. Just down the hall on the starboard side, you'll find the ship's library. I'm a big reader, and this was the first space I headed to when we got on board. I was in absolute heaven here. I've never seen a more beautiful and well-stocked ship library. It felt like walking into a brand new Barnes & Noble bookshop. Not a lot of seating in here, the space is primarily dedicated to the cheery bright book displays, all well organized by genre. Checkout and return is by honor system. Moving toward midship, you'll find two music venues right across from each other. Billboard Onboard and the Rolling Stone Rock Room. Welcome to the start of Music Walk. In case you weren't already aware, Holland America is all about the music, and these two venues, along with the B.B. King Blues Club that we'll discuss shortly, form the entertainment epicenter of the ship. Each of the Music Walk venues has a different theme, and they are all open lounges. No doors or walls or lines to enter, so you can just casually dip in and out as you please. Even if the seating is full, you can always hang out on the perimeter to still enjoy the entertainment. The venues are literally part of the main corridor of Deck 2, making them easy spots to drop in for a song or a drink as you make your way through your evening plans. Billboard On Board is home to the dueling pianos. This was my first experience with this form of music and entertainment, and it ended up being my favorite music venue. They sing and play and take requests and keep you completely engaged. The musicians on our cruise really fed off each other and just oozed talent with both their instruments and with their vocals in a way I've never witnessed before. Billboard On Board has plenty of seating and a bar just a few steps from the pianos so you never have to miss a note. Directly across from Billboard On Board is the Rolling Stone Rock Room, the aptly named rock venue, where you'll hear classic hits, mostly from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The talent level is also sky high here. Plenty of seating here, as well as its own bar. Since the two venues are directly across from each other, they are on opposite performing schedules. 
So as soon as one show wraps up, you can casually meander a few feet over to the other side for the next one. Before leaving this area, you'll pass by Notes, an eye-catching dedicated whiskey bar with over 100 labels on display. I'm not a whiskey drinker, so I didn't personally sample anything here. But for whiskey fans, there are tasting menus and chances to sample some of the rarest whiskeys in the world. You'll pass a restroom while heading into the next section of the plaza deck, and I just wanted to make mention here that the public restrooms on this ship are plentiful, easy to find, and always kept sparkling clean. Now, back to the fun stuff. Next up, on the ship's port side, you'll find the third music venue, the BB King Blues Club. As you may guess, this venue features a delightful mix of southern blues, jazz, and soul music performed on a large stage in front of a big dance floor. There's seating all around, as well as additional seating up on deck three if you prefer to watch the action from above with a bird's eye view. As with the world stage, there are servers who take drink orders here. There's a partition between this venue and the other two on Music Walk, so BB King shows can run simultaneously with one of the shows on the other side. The performance schedule for all three venues can be found in the daily program dropped off nightly in the staterooms or on the Holland America app. It's worth mentioning that the BB King Blues Club is also the hub for the once a sailing Orange Party, where Holland America pays tribute to its Dutch heritage and everyone gets dolled up in their best orange outfits and accessories. I overheard quite a few first-time Holland America cruisers mention that they wish they had known about the orange party, so I'm including it in the ship tour. If you want to join, pack your orange. Themed accessories are also available on board. Across from BB King and heading more midship, you'll find the first shopping area. Simply called the shops, this is the area where you'll find your more higher-end merchandise. Perfumes, jewelry, and watches can all be found in this section. More basic things, such as souvenirs, snacks, or toiletries, can be found in the Deck 3 shops, which we'll see in a bit. This area was also home to one of my favorite parts of the ship, although it is a very seasonal display. The Gingerbread Village, complete with a model train. I cruised over Christmas, so the ship was decorated for the holidays, with this display being the best part. It was so intricately detailed, I think I saw something new every time I looked at it. So if you're sailing during the holiday season, be on the lookout for the beautiful gingerbread village. It's pretty hard to miss. In the atrium area, you'll find two of the specialty restaurants, the Pinnacle Grill and Rudy's Cell de Mer. Both of these restaurants are an extra charge. The Pinnacle Grill is Holland America Line's signature steakhouse, providing guests with an elevated menu, award-winning wines, and impeccable service. They're known for their clothesline candied bacon appetizer, which we tried amongst other things. My boyfriend was quite pleased with his steak, and as a non-steak eater, I was happy with the variety of the remaining menu options and ended up with a delectable plate of scallops. This was probably the best meal we had on board, and it was absolutely worth the upcharge. On the other side of the atrium, you'll find Rudy's Cell de Mer, the seafood brasserie. This restaurant is also an upcharge. We did have reservations, but unfortunately had to cancel them, so I didn't get to try it. The menu looks incredible though, and I've heard good things, although I have also heard that this restaurant may be replaced soon. If anyone has feedback on Rudy's, do let me know in the comments how it was, or what the future plans for this space may be. Across from Rudy's, you'll find the restaurant reservations desk, where you can make bookings for all the onboard specialty restaurants. You'll also find the Ocean Bar, a casual spot to grab a cocktail and enjoy the beautiful ocean views. They even make some specialty drinks here, which can get pretty fancy. The Ocean Bar has a large seating area and is also home to some of the daytime scheduled activities. Several adult coloring sessions were held here, and I took them way more seriously than I probably should have. Heading farther aft down the hallway will lead you to another fun spot, the Half Moon Bar. This is a new concept for Holland America, an immersive cocktail experience where each featured drink tells a tale about the line's storied 150-year history. Nothing like drinking with an education. Next up on the ship's port side is the Club Orange Dining Room, reserved for members of Holland America's premium amenities program. I didn't get to enter as I am not a member, but you can see a bit of what it looks like inside. We're finally all the way aft, and here you'll find the first level of the two-deck main dining room. This is the sit-down dining space included in the cruise fare, and where we ate dinner about half the time. They also serve breakfast daily and lunch on sea days. Every night, a three-course menu was offered, with five to six options per course, and you can order more than one thing if you can't make up your mind. 
The dining room is an elegant space, very light and airy, with blue, white, and yellow glass ceiling fixtures. The service was lovely and the food was quite good. Definitely better than many restaurants I've been to on land. And with that, we'll move up to deck three, the promenade deck. Deck three is also jam-packed, full of public areas. Navigation around the ship is pretty straightforward though. These maps I've been showing you are found at each elevator bank by the buttons, and signs are posted everywhere around the ship to guide you in the right direction. There are also carpet signs on the elevator floors, just in case you forget what day it is. So let's head back to the front of the ship and work our way aft, as we did with Deck 2. All the way forward, you'll find the upper seating sections of the World Stage Theater. Since we discussed this space on Deck 2, we'll move on. But before we start heading down the main hallway of Deck 3, let's take a peek at Deck 3's namesake, the Promenade. The outdoor promenade deck goes all the way around the ship, with three laps equaling about a mile or 1.6 kilometers. It does duck under cover for a bit as you're making your circle, and it was in one of these covered areas that I stumbled across the dog relief area for anyone out there who may travel with a service animal. The deck was never very crowded, although it can be quite windy out there. While I love all the excitement that the insides of modern cruise ships have to offer, sometimes it's just nice to take a stroll on the promenade and just feel the simplicity of being out to sea. Let's head back inside and start moving midship to our first new indoor space, the casino. The casino isn't very big on the Rotterdam, but it's got enough to keep you busy if you like to gamble. It offers a good variety of slot machines and table games and is of course only open when the ship is out at sea. The casino is connected to Music Walk by Staircase for easy flow between the entertainment areas. Moving on, you'll pass a small art gallery on the port side as you arrive at the shops on the starboard. As mentioned earlier, these shops are a bit different from the higher level products found downstairs, although there are plenty of high quality items to be found here as well. But if you're looking for a Holland America branded jacket or shirt, some duty free cigarettes or alcohol, or if you simply forgot to pack an essential toiletry, then the promenade deck shops are where you need to be. I may have gone home with one of these Louis the Lions and also maybe one of these stuffed cruise ships. Across from the shops is the BB King balcony, where as mentioned earlier, you can check out the live music from a bird's eye view. Solidly midship now, we return for our final visit to the top floor of the atrium. Here you'll find the guest services desk where any issues, problems, or questions can be addressed. This space is also home to the future cruises desk. Cruise lines always offer perks if you sign up for your next sailing on board your current one, so don't forget to stop by the desk if you know you want to sail again in the near future. Across from guest services, on the starboard side, you'll find a uniquely Holland America dining venue, the Grand Dutch Cafe. This casual space is great for chatting or getting a bit of work done while enjoying one of the many featured Dutch specialties. There's a good selection of Dutch and Belgian beers, coffees, casual snacks, and made to order food. I loved the blue and white decor and furniture, and my favorite spot to sit was in this little side room overlooking the promenade deck. The food at the Grand Dutch Cafe is complimentary and included in the fare, although alcohol and specialty coffees are an extra charge. Continuing to head aft, you'll arrive at the photo shop. If you take any professional photos on board, this is where you'll go to review your images, make your selections, and pick up your prints. Staff are available to help you navigate the ordering system and make sure you get the right selections. You can also browse the shop's keepsake frames and photo mounting options, and the shop sells a small selection of camera gear just in case you need a new toy for the trip. We're now all the way aft again, back at the main dining room. The upstairs section is very similar to the downstairs area on deck two that we've already looked at, so let's take the stairs up to deck four. As we head up, I'll make mention here of another feature to note on the Rotterdam, the artwork. Staircases and elevator lobbies on board here aren't just a means to move people around. They also serve as tiny museums scattered all around the ship. I'll show you as much of the artwork as I can, but there really are so many lovely pieces, it would be impossible to share them all. The Beethoven deck will be quick, as it is exclusively staterooms. If your cabin isn't here, then unless you are checking out the stairwell or elevator lobby artwork, there's just not much to visit. With that said, let's head up to deck 5. The Gershwin deck is also exclusively cabins, but we will spend a bit more time here since this is where my stateroom was, so I'll give you a little tour. If you're not interested in the short room tour, then feel free to skip to the next deck. 
The cabin was a bit smaller than what I've stayed in before on Norwegian and Carnival, but still had a good amount of storage space. Really simple decor, maybe even bordering on too bland. Loved the complimentary reusable totes and the provided robes and beach towels. The on-demand TV offerings absolutely blew me away. You could spend your whole trip watching movies if you wanted and never run out. Very comfy bed and good-sized balcony also. Love that the balcony chairs had footrests, made sitting out there so much more comfortable. For a two-week cruise, having the balcony was a wonderful choice. Overall, we were very, very happy with the room. That's all for Deck 5, so let's head up to Deck 6. By now, you may have noticed the music theme with the deck names, and that will continue for a few more decks. But like Gershwin, the Mozart deck is exclusively cabins, so let's keep heading up. The Schubert deck is almost also all exclusively cabins, except for one semi-public area, the Neptune Lounge. Available only to those staying in certain suite categories, the Neptune Lounge offers those guests a secluded place to relax and snack during the day, along with access to a private concierge service to handle all potential specialty arrangements on board. All right, up to deck eight we go. The navigation deck, named as it is home to the ship's bridge, is also exclusively cabins for guests. So with that said, we can head up to deck nine where things start to get more interesting again, I promise. Welcome to the Lido deck, where any guest will undoubtedly spend a ton of time. We'll start at the front of the ship as always, which is home to the greenhouse spa and salon and fitness center. These are all part of the same area, so we'll start with the very front of the ship, the fitness center. It's a decent sized gym with all the basics, although as someone who works out a fair bit, I do wish they stocked foam rollers for pre and post workout stretching. But otherwise, no complaints. It's a clean space, plenty of towels, and of course, like any other cruise ship gym, it can get quite crowded on sea days. The treadmills offer beautiful panoramic bow views to help distract you while you're running. There are a few mats for stretching and floor work, some bikes, ellipticals, an area for free weights, and a few basic machines. Two classrooms on the side for group workouts and seminars, and the spaces are free for you to use on your own when they're empty. Moving a bit toward midship, on the starboard side, you'll find the small lobby and reception desk for the greenhouse spa and salon. There are two areas right off the lobby for hair and nail services. Across from the reception area, you'll find the hallways that lead to the massage treatment rooms. You'll find a wide variety of spa and massage options available, some of which you can combine into fun spa day packages. There's also an onboard acupuncturist who I had a lovely chat with while touring the area, so if you are interested in acupuncture, that's also an option on board. The treatment rooms vary depending on their function, but they're all comfy and peaceful spaces. I had two massages on board, one hot stone and one bamboo. While the onboard spa services are pricey, I enjoyed both of my treatments and would certainly book again on a future cruise. If you're interested in massage services, particularly on sea days, do book before your cruise or as soon as you board. Their schedules fill up very quickly. The last piece of the spa, salon, and gym area is one of my favorite spots on the ship, the thermal spa. This area is an extra cost, but if you enjoy these types of spaces, it's well worth it. The centerpiece of the thermal spa is the large central hydro pool, featuring massage jets that can be turned on and off as you please. One thing to note is that this pool came in handy on some of the rougher sea days we had. The outdoor pools and hot tubs were closed a few times due to the ocean swells, but this pool always stayed open. And that's why you may also notice the water moving around a fair bit in some of these shots. I loved the string lights on the ceiling, and there are pool-friendly day beds and soft benches on the pool's perimeter. I took many a late afternoon nap on one of these. Towels and water are provided, although no tea, snacks, or robes. Just outside the hydro pool room, you'll find a second room featuring 11 heated stone loungers. Here is where you'll also find some of the fancy showers, like this one with the bucket and this horizontal one. There's a small and large wet sauna, and as a glasses wearer, I do have to shout out these very thoughtful eyeglass racks. Just down the hallway from the thermal spa, you'll find the separate men's and women's dry saunas, which are open for all guests to use. You don't need a thermal spa pass. 
They're kind of hidden, but know they are available to you free of charge. Upon exiting the spa area, you'll find yourself at the Lido pool deck, where you'll likely spend a fair bit of time. The pool itself is fairly large, with three slightly elevated hot tubs located on the aft end. Above the forward end of the pool is a large screen used for showing movies and sporting events. During the day, it mostly just had a screensaver type image on it. The pool is surrounded on three sides with several rows of padded chaise loungers and additional seating with tables that can be found near the hot tubs and next to the windows. Unlike many ships, the poolside seating here can have nice thick cushions because the chairs aren't exposed to the elements. The Rotterdam pool deck has a retractable roof. We'll take a closer look at it when we get to deck 11. When it's time to clean up and dry off after the pool, there are a couple of outdoor showers to rinse and pool towels are plentiful and easy to replace without signing for them. The pool area also has a spiral staircase for easy access to deck 10. Be aware, there's no lifeguard on duty here, so do keep an eye on kids or anyone in your party who isn't a strong swimmer. The Lido pool was always a popular spot during our cruise, but we never struggled too much to find a seat. At the aft end of the Lido pool deck, you'll find three food and beverage spots. On the starboard side, Dive In is the poolside burger spot, with convenient ordering available from the Holland America app so you can keep hanging by the pool until your food is ready. I had a few burgers here and they were quite tasty, although the cheese sauce on the fries I didn't love. Dive In is included with the cruise fare. Across from Dive In is the Gelato Milkshake and Juice Bar, which does have a small upcharge. I'm embarrassed to say how many gelatos I bought during my cruise, they were delicious and addictive. The third spot here is, of course, the Lido Bar, offering all of your standard bar drinks. If you prefer to stay relaxing by the pool, there are servers who circulate and take drink orders. We'll head back inside now to check out another quintessential spot on any cruise ship, the buffet. There's a sink for hand washing immediately upon entering, so don't forget that happy happy washy washy. Before we fully enter the Lido Market though, we'll check out the Canaletto space on the starboard side. During the day, this seating is part of the Lido Market Buffet, but at night, Canaletto transforms into the specialty Italian restaurant, available for a small upcharge. I didn't get to eat here, but if you have, let me know in the comments what you thought of it. Okay, now officially moving on to the buffet. The Lido Market is the second of the two included primary food spots, with the other being the main dining room that we visited on decks two and three. It's a large dining space, taking up almost a third of the length of the Lido deck, but finding a seat during peak hours can still take a few minutes of searching. The Rotterdam is a newer ship, and you can tell that the COVID-19 pandemic had an effect on how the buffet is set up. There's a lot of glass separating the guests from the food, which is of course great for hygiene, but it does slow down the serving process a bit. Some items in the buffet are set up for self-service, usually the more basic things like bread, garnishes, fruit, cookies, that type of stuff. But the vast majority of the prepared food is behind glass and requires a staff member to serve you. During peak dining times, you may have to wait in some lines to get the food you're after. Occasionally, it was a bit vague if an item was self-service or not, but basic rule of thumb is if the tongs face you, you can take it yourself. If the tongs face away, even if you can easily reach them and the food they're set up for, then wait for the staff member to serve you. There are many stations throughout both sides of the Lido market, with most items appearing on each side. Each station has a general theme, such as homestead classics, international cuisine, the roasting pan, wild harvest salads, breadboard sandwiches, you get the idea. Each station has a menu board with descriptions of what's available. There are dessert stations as well, of course, along with self-serve coffee, tea, and water. Additional beverages, such as sodas or iced teas, can be ordered through the servers that rotate around, and there's a small bar if you want to pick up something else. The Lido Market is always open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it's a great alternative in the evenings if you're not feeling the fancier vibe and longer serve time of the main dining room. The buffet food is pretty good across the board, some things of course we like better than others, but in general, you'll get a very satisfactory meal up here at the Lido Market. Emerging from the Lido Market, you'll be on the aft deck, home to the Sea View Pool. 
While technically adults only, the sign indicating so is very small, and the policy didn't seem to be enforced much on our sailing. That said, Holland America isn't a super popular line for families with small children, so if you're not sailing over a big school holiday break, then you likely won't have many kids around anyway. The Sea View Pool is a nice alternative from the hustle and bustle of the Lido Pool, with plenty of seating, some of which faces the ship's stern, overlooking the ocean. There are two hot tubs and a couple of outdoor showers here as well. The chaise loungers back here are much more basic than the ones at the Lido Pool, since these are entirely exposed to the elements. The Sea View Bar is found on the starboard side, as is the smoking section, so if cigarette smoke bothers you, then you'll want to stick to the very back or the port side of the pool deck. And with that, we're finished with the Lido Deck. Let's head up to Deck 10. The front of Deck 10 is composed of cabins, but mid-shift to aft are all public spaces. First public space is the balcony area surrounding the Lido pool deck. You'll find additional seating here, and as mentioned earlier, there are two spiral staircases for easy access down to the pool. No lounge chairs up here, but you'll find a nice variety of couches, tables, and day beds. Tucked in a corner, you'll also find the ping pong tables. Two food and beverage areas up here to note. On the starboard side, you'll find the panorama bar, and on the port side, you'll find a New York deli and pizza, which is open for lunch, dinner, and movie night snacks. Like Dive-In, it is included in the fare and makes for a nice poolside meal. I tried one of their made-to-order pizzas, and for cruise ship pizza, I thought it was pretty good. Midship on Deck 10, you'll find Club HAL, which is Holland America's kids' activities program. While Holland America isn't geared toward families the way lines like Royal Caribbean or Carnival are, Holland America does have the kids' club available for ages 3 to 17 on sailings 24 days or less. Moving aft, you'll find some open deck space to take a stroll or just sit quietly and enjoy those beautiful views. The shuffleboard courts are also here, which I still have not tried yet. Every cruise I mean to and never quite get to it. At the back of the ship, you'll find two specialty dining areas. Tamarind, featuring flavors from Southeast Asia, China, and Japan, and Nami Sushi, which is a sushi bar within the tamarind space. There's also a bar within the restaurant space, serving standard drinks along with specialty Asian-themed cocktails. We had a lovely dinner at Tamarind, ordering probably half the appetizers on the menu. My ginger lobster main was divine. My only regret was the lack of additional stomach capacity. Really loved the upscale elegant tamarind space and thought this was very much worth the small upcharge. The final part of the panorama deck located behind the tamarind restaurant space are two small balcony areas with seating surrounding the sea view pool area. There are staircases for easy access down to the pool. And with that, we'll move up to deck 11. The sun deck is a similar setup to the panorama deck, with cabins at the front of the ship and then public spaces midship and aft. Deck 11 is the highest deck on the Rotterdam that features cabins. Midship, you'll find the outdoor dogging track, which circles the Lido pool area. It's here where you can get a close look at the retractable roof. We had a lot of weather on our two-week sailing, so the roof was open and closed a few times. Sometimes it was open just a crack, if bad weather was approaching, but not quite there yet. But even when weather approaches quickly, they can get the roof closed pretty fast. Really brilliant idea for a cruise ship, and I hope everyone starts installing these. The only downside is that when the roof is closed, the Lido area can get quite humid and stuffy, but that's a small price to pay to be able to stay on the pool deck in the rain. Moving aft, you'll come to the sports court, which is multi-purpose and has basketball nets, but seem to be mainly used for pickleball. I've never played and really wanted to attend one of their organized introductory lessons, but I never quite got to it. Hoping to give it a try next time. You'll also find up here some outdoor fitness equipment and the cornhole boards. At the very back of the ship, you'll find the main sun deck outdoor area, which was closed off when I was filming the ship, but you can see it a bit in the background in the shot taken from the sea view pool. It's a basic deck, lounge, and viewing area. And with that, up to deck 12 we go. Right off the bat, you'll see what inspired this deck's name as you enter the beautiful multi-purpose space that is the Crow's Nest, Exploration Central, and Cafe. Three different names, but it's really all one area. 
The crow's nest is the forward-facing observation lounge. It's filled with comfy chairs overlooking the ocean and plenty of tables and couches for working, quiet chatting, reading, or relaxing. There's a pair of binoculars to take a closer look at any surrounding vessels, and there are also a couple of televisions, although I never actually saw them on. The earthy, neutral tones of the space make for a calming environment that felt like a homey escape from the busier parts of the ship. The cafe counter serves small snacks, specialty teas, and coffees. Alcoholic beverages are also served. The exploration central portion of this space is sort of like the ship's visitor center. There are interactive touch tables with information about the ports, the cruise line, and trivia questions. It's also home to the shore excursions desk, where you can inquire on ports and book activities for port days. In a semi-separate area, you'll find an incredibly well-stocked game room. Most ships have games on board to borrow, but I've never seen anything as beautiful as this space. I'm not much into board games, but just being in this space made me want to immediately learn to play chess. It was empty when I filmed it, but on sea days, especially in poor weather, this space gets jam-packed. Directly outside of the Exploration Central area is a private outdoor area called The Retreat. This secluded space includes private cabanas, lounge chairs, bar service, and one hot tub. The Retreat access does come with an extra charge. Most ships, including the Rotterdam, do not have a Deck 13, so up we go to Deck 14, the very top deck, aptly named the Sky Deck. Like a deck at the start, the Sky Deck is not mentioned on the official published Rotterdam deck list, so no deck plan on the right-hand side as you've been accustomed to. Of course, the onboard maps by the elevators always show the entire ship, so we can see where it is from this instead. It's a small space, but it is worth a visit to check out the highest point you can visit on board. It's at the very front of the ship, and if you don't mind the wind, it offers you epic views of your surroundings. It's a great spot to take in the open ocean or wave goodbye as you prepare to sail away from a port. Speaking of ports, I'll be posting plenty of videos this year of the full cruise experience on board the Rotterdam, including all the fun activities I did in the seven ports of call we visited, along with an overall cruise vlog on the journey as a whole. So stay tuned for that in the coming weeks. There's a ton more I have to share with you all. Thanks for joining me for today's tour of the Rotterdam. I hope you enjoyed checking out everything that this wonderful ship has to offer. If you enjoy all things cruising, then check out one of my other cruise vlogs or ship tours above. And don't forget to subscribe for future travel adventures. Thanks and see you next time.